the On Security Podcast aims to inform and challenge the viewer on all things cybersecurity. Our sponsor, Onshore Security, is a premier provider of full telemetry cybersecurity detection via its Panoptic Cyber Defense Service and Managed Security Solutions. Welcome, everybody. This is Onshore On Security Podcast. Uh, my name is Stel Valavanis. I'm the CEO of Onshore Security. Uh, and we, you know, we did this podcast because we realized these discussions are so much more valuable than just kind of presentations and you know whatnot. And uh, you know, our, our guests are people that we really engage with. Uh, today we have Robert Goskowitz. Robert is a founder of um, uh, Nullify. Uh, Robert, say hi. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey everyone, uh, I would say what long time listener, first time caller. Um, <laughs> back in the day, but, yeah, no, uh, Robert Goskowitz, I'm the founder of Nullify. Actually. Uh, Joke that I'm a recovering lawyer, so I think uh, a lot of the, the lens I applied to the cybersecurity framework and, and mindsets and everything that we'll talk about today, you know, I kind of uh, view through uh, a risk mitigation perspective, which I know, uh, you know, really jives very well with with what I know onshore security and still prioritize for all their clients. Um, we've, you know, talked with you in the past. I really enjoy and, and appreciate what you guys have going on in your content, so I'm really uh, excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, and of course, Josh Eckler is our producer. Say hi, Josh. Hey, everybody. Thank you. Great, great. All right. Well, um, uh, yeah, and uh, so we're loving uh, this uh, this platform here, getting used to it, and <clears throat> uh, let's uh, uh, let's hope that um, uh, that uh, we're really able to you know keep doing this um, because we got a real good queue of, of of guests of people that I just had amazing discussions with, and Robert and I had. <clears throat> had had some uh, a number of discussions in the past, and a lot of it started with like, what's our partnership potential, whatever. But I just find out right away that there's a lot of very different views about how cybersecurity should be addressed, what's the priorities, you know, whatnot, where the value lies, doesn't lie, whatnot. And I would say it's more fragment than the IT space has ever been, um, uh, you know, uh, and it dovetails into other fields, let's say more so. So today, the one thing that I really love talking about with Robert before, and, and I will be able to elaborate on, is kind of like this, what I consider like an over-focus on endpoint security. Not that that isn't wonderful what's going on there, um, but just, just this whole, so much more to that, like, I don't know what you call it, the whole exposure that's out there, all of those attack vectors, you know, data, whatnot. So uh, Robert, kind of pick up where we were on that. Tell me what you know you see that's outside that space, and uh, you know with the with the nullify lens, of course, because uh, I think Absolutely. that's what inspired me. No, happy to happy to chat with that. And obviously, if I go uh, off base, you want to drill down more. You know, you just just let me know. Otherwise, I'm uh, uh, yeah. just going to talk. That's that's okay. good at. Um, <laughs> so yeah, no, I mean, I, th I think the the interesting thing uh, that that we've been seeing is, as you said, the the cybersecurity landscape's been getting a lot more multifaceted and a lot more fragmented. Um, and that's that's both bad, but it's also extremely good in that people are starting to expand kind of their worldview of what constitutes cybersecurity. Where's the line between cybersecurity and cyber privacy, data privacy, data protection mm -hmm. versus data collection, and you know methodologies? Where does that line start to to draw? And it's it's an extremely dynamic and evolving space. So anything I say here will probably be different next week, right? Um, which okay. is okay. Exciting. Yeah. Um, but but I think you're back. Right. I think. Yeah. 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 Hey, love to be back. <laughs> but I think you know the, the interesting thing is, as you said, one of the one of the historical uh, real priorities was always endpoints, and everyone's familiar with that, even from way back in the day when you had the floppy disks and everything. You know, antivirus. You know, McAfee's and and uh, all those. It was really about antiviruses. What's the virus on my computer? Oh God, there's a virus on my computer. There's you know everyone. That was where your mindset. And quite frankly, it's logical. That's literally the thing sitting in front of you that you are touching. And when it starts not working, and there's that scary moment where the spinning wheel of death comes up, you know, that's that, that sinking feeling in your stomach, oh God, there's something wrong. But of course, nowadays, that's, that's just one facet of the entire kind of environment where companies are living, right? Um, and in some ways, because that focus has been on the endpoint for so long, it's been commoditized, right? There, there's so much device management, there's so much device check. I mean, even this recording, literally, if I click on my name, it says, you know, device has past health check, right? I mean, it, it does that. Everyone gets it. They know it. It's been, it's been done. Um, and that's not to say it's not important, but I think it is to say that we need to start broadening our lens, broadening our view, right? Um, and, and people slowly are. Um, that's really kind of gone a lot of different directions. One, of course, is the big focus that it's very hard if you're in the space to not hear about um, 
all the time, which is zero trust and, and perimeterless corporate environments, right? Um, the corporate perimeter is gone, really. And that, and that was almost the case before COVID. And now since COVID, with employees all over, I mean, none of us are in the same location, right? And, and still, I would bet a lot of your employees are not in the same location, right? No. Um, zero. Yeah, and exactly. And, and by definition, the perimeter, it's gone. So how do you deal with that fact? And you start realizing that, sure, the endpoint's connecting to what? Right. And that's that's where you say that's that yeah, first yeah. step is, OK, well, a database, an application, other people's computers uh, we're communicating via Slack. We're all looking at the same data in HubSpot or Zendesk. You know, I've got an outsourced team for customer service, but in-house team for data analytics. Where do those two overlap? Right. Can one update data and not? And it starts getting both complex, uh, also exciting, also scary um, and starts really uh really questioning kind of, or makes you question really where is it perimeterless or is the perimeter squiggly, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and how do you deal with that? And on both sides, not just around the endpoint, but also around the data that that endpoint's connected to. Um, and I think it's a really uh, kind of evolving and interesting space in that, like you said, really now the focus um, is really getting more on the data side. It's on the other side of the pipe. And okay. give us examples. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. There was examples of that, that daily. I want to know, like, what is the, I mean, the, the, you know, because an endpoint could mean like a server too. So when you say data, what do you, what do you mean? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. So, so that's one of those, those things that's also kind of people are really defining uh, as we go, but, but you're entirely right. There's a lot of different facets of, of the data side of the pipe. One is just straight up database. And that's what, I mean, it's just, it's a database. Where is your data stored? Is it a data warehouse, data lake, you know, production environments, staging environments, Amazon, Google, on-prem, et cetera. And, that, and that's some people's first order of business. And it should be. It's where is our data stored? What security methods do they have? But also the, the really interesting component is that data is a lot more complex in a lot of ways. Um, it's, it's dynamic. It's living. It's kind of uh, living and breathing much as, as a company lives and breathes, right? There's things coming in. It's being collected updated, discarded, paired with other data, right? And then and then generating in and of itself a new piece of data through that pairing mm -hmm. is being used in, in different ways by different teams and different applications literally every minute of every day. So the the fallacy is to think that data is the static zero and one. And that, oh, I encrypt and therefore my data is secure. And the answer is that's that's not the case at all because in that one instance, in that one minute, in that one repository, that might be secure, right? But then look at how your company is working and using and people, which we'll talk about because I think and that that's a key focus on onshore side as well as the people, the processes, what's happening? How are you running a business, right? And that's really all based on data nowadays. So the real trick is, you know, it's, it's you can kind of think of data almost as like inf information or, or knowledge uh, of a company being in a room full of people talking is the way we kind of, think of it. And and what I mean by that is what is getting passed in and out and getting received and being stored versus discarded is extremely important, but it's a very hard thing to always 100% every second of every day keep track of. And that's extremely hard. Um, stuff that sticks around might be people's names. It might be people's eye colors. It might be someone that had a medical procedure kind of like yours, right? Mm -hmm. That what defines them and what people you like or don't like it and like a company, what, what customers you latch on to what, what people don't buy. Why aren't they buying? You know, it's uh, extremely sensitive for that reason. Mm -hmm. so, so where are those points that you've been asked to, to like to gain visibility on and secure? You know, what are those, yeah. those, those specific, you know, I don't know, points or I don't know, act, uh, access and control or what, whatever you took, where, what are, what are you being asked to say? You know, thank sure. you, Robert, there's, there's, there's exposure here. Absolutely. So, so it's been really interesting in that a lot of companies you can gauge how, um, how kind of dynamically and, 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 and in some ways how kind of sophisticated they are about their mindset more than anything else towards data, data security, data privacy. Uh, because at a basic level, a lot will say, look, I need to protect my data warehouse. If that data warehouse gets accessed, I'm in a lot of trouble because that's where all my data okay. lives. And that is, that's true. That's, I would never say that's wrong. It's, it's a great methodology. Then what people kind of evolve into is, well, wait a second. So if we protect the data in my data warehouse, I know my data analytics team uses a BI tool, you know, like a Tableau or okay. Redash, et cetera. Um, and they're, they're pulling. So even if I encrypt it in my database, 
it's pulling out and showing in plain text. And wait a second, right. they're in right. 20 different countries, right? Um, so that application is kind of a risk. And I guess that's also pulling data from my CRM and mm -hmm. my customer service, you know, et cetera. So some of the more interesting use cases, as you said, where, where they say, holy bleep, um, I really need to kind of see and control who's seeing what, because at a fundamental level, that's all cybersecurity, at least on the IT or information uh, side is, is who can see what, where, when? That's the big question. Who can see what, where? And a hacker is really just a question of that. It's someone who should not have seen that then, right? Um, right. So really the, the big ones are things like CRMs uh, on the application level, not on the database level. So sure. something yep. like a yep. sales, uh, HubSpot, Zoho. Um, also customer service, things like Zendesk, uh, people realize they don't have baked in data visibility controls. How do you prevent a customer service rep from seeing a customer's social security, home address, uh, ABA number, medical diagnostic code, insurance number? They can request it, right? It's it's very hard to control. And really, still to your point, where we're the kind of exciting stuff that we've been asked to protect is how all of those applications standardize. Because even if you can get a control hmm. in Salesforce, you still have an exposure in Zendesk and HubSpot and Redash and QuickBooks and, you know, et cetera. And the list goes on. So how do you standardize a permission? And that's really where, where our company kind of uh, cut its teeth, quite frankly, is, is injecting standardized data visibility controls into different applications because that was kind of the, one of the last frontiers of, of data security that really hadn't been focused on. I mean, was this an easy thing to do? Did the tool set, did the, all the, I mean, these are the very large disparate set of, you know, sources, data, applications and whatever. So... So uh, um, did they did they play ball? Are there good kind of methods in place? Is there a good documentation, controls, or did you have to kind of beat down the door and make things happen? Oh, definitely the latter. Um, the unambiguously, the, the interesting thing is when you really consider a, a lot of these, and it's a perfectly logical position, but these applications were built at this point two, five, 10, 15 years ago was their okay. core code. And this was not a concern at that point, right? Um, and the amount of rip and replace that these massive architectures would have to do in order to inject sophisticated field level data controls. So, you know, um, you know, I, I guess I'll get to a, a customer story, like why we built this and why it was part. One of the, this unicorn startup came to us and said, look, my team uses about 75 different applications. This, this, this is an origin story now, right? Is this an origin this story? Is, this is sorry, okay. this okay. origin story. Go, exactly. uh, no, I love it. Go ahead. I just want to be clear. Yeah. Uh, there's an origin story. So, so we had a, a kind of advanced aliasing synthetic data creation API SDK based product. It was it was well received, but this this unicorn uh, startup came to us and said, "Hey, here's the problem. It's great for my databases, but I have 75 different applications that link to the database and are given the keys to the kingdom to pull data out and display it in plain text to teams around the world." Yeah. Now, some of these tools have pretty good granular visibility controls, 98% of them. You know, of my 75 tools, maybe three are actually good, and I need to individually manage them, so they're siloed. Um, and the 72 other ones have nothing. I can name someone an admin or a non-admin. That's it, right? And all I want is the ability to say, developers can't see customer credit cards, or developers can't see social security numbers. I just, right. Right. It's, it's crazy, as you said, I just can't do that. It's, it's a very foundational basic concept. Um, but to your point, Stel, then the, the real work began. So we started validating that and it, and it looked like a lot of companies were having that problem. So the real trick was that, like you said, applications don't even 99% of the time give, say, API endpoints for an external vendor to do this, right? So you can't really integrate successfully. Now, some of the previous solutions that, that are important and good, I would say, but, but limited in that, um, they focus on the tools that do give those endpoints, right? So uh, Dropbox, okay, right? Maybe Slack. Um, but the real question, as I said, was there were 75 tools his team uses. So you can't have a patchwork approach. You have to be able to say, hmm. I can remove credit card dynamically on the fly before a, a developer sees it in any of these apps, if it's gonna be displayed. Because the other thing we're not talking about, Stell, is in order to usually do this sort of thing, um, it's it's extremely expensive, extremely hard and time consuming, but also you need to have an accurate inventory of what's being stored where. That's a whole separate question, right? And it might change again tomorrow. So the real question, and the, and the person said, to your point about transparency, I don't know what my team is storing tomorrow. Even if I ask them today, someone's going to do something stupid. We're going to hire someone out, you know, and they don't know our policy. I can't train them every day. I need to train them, but I can't do it every day, right? So, so the idea is how do we do that? So it was a very complex system and it had to rely on non just the standard API connections as, oh, as no. handy as they are. 
Um, so really bridging the gap of power, but usability was our challenge. Oh, yeah, that's uh, yeah, and I, I I remember you know you know this hearing this description, and it just se- it seemed kind of like this this heavy lift, and you know yeah you, you, so you have to add this kind of layer in to do it. But I I actually have to say it's it's amazing how seamless it uh, it ended up being, and uh, um, okay. you know, and I know too, like a lot of a lot of the challenge is the um, you know for the for our, you know for our our customers for you know businesses trying to you know operate is is, you know, they can put all these rules in place that they want, but they need to be able to demonstrate and self-attestation is not, you know, necessarily good enough. So I like it for that reason too, that there's like, look, I mean, they can't see this data. I don't have to, you know, I, I worry about, you know, what's going on, but I can prove that, you know, they they can't see, you know, the, certain people can't see this or this data. I mean, frankly, I already argue these controls should be in place already in these systems, but they're not. And you were posed with this problem uh, and you took that challenge on. Um, you know, thank you. Well, uh, tell us, um, uh, tell us a little bit more now about these, uh, this, you know, um, you know, control and access, whatever, um, you know, you know, what's the evolution you had to go through? You realize there's, you know, you're got to beat down the door. You realize these controls are in place. They don't even necessarily give you kind of APIs. So you took a whole other approach. Um, and so describe that evolution. Cause I know you went through a a couple iterations before you settled on your current model. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, we had to we had to pivot and, and enhance the product and, and, yeah. and shifted a, a lot based on, as you said, what, what it was a trial and error, right? And this is why I think it's it hadn't been done before, just because it's extremely hard and extremely nuanced and complicated. And mind you, I can't take credit for any of this. It's our it's our tech team. I'm not a developer, so anything I say about how cool the technology is, please, uh, you know, refer to uh, our our uh, CTO. But the the real idea, you're exactly right, is how do you build a system that can uh, be tool agnostic? Like we were just talking about, right? I right. can't big, yeah, play big it. challenge. Yeah. Big challenge. That was the yeah. biggest hurdle, right? Yeah. Um, once you you cross that hurdle, so you can say, okay, I can apply this to any tool. Then the real question is, how do you make a system that that has two kind of uh, main components? One is, and and I, I'm sure we'll get into this at some point in terms of like what is a priority for moving forward, but um, usability. It sounds crazy, but but historically there have been a lot of very impressive cybersecurity tools that are extremely hard to use and above and beyond just the, hey, I don't like using it problem. That actually opens up a whole nother threat layer that when an enemy knows how to use your tool better than you do, that Hmm. is a real problem, Hmm. right? And they can spend all day, every day examining just these tools and you need to go about your life and do other stuff. So um, even on a security level, usability is paramount, right? It's gotta be easy. Now, the other hurdle we were were kind of uh, trying to, to solve is not just usability, but really who at the end of the day would be using this, right? And that actually even, you know, by the month right now is really shifting because cybersecurity with things like the executive order from President Biden, cybersecurity is becoming more mainstream. And if we're talking about the lack of controls on very popular applications and databases, this is not purely Bank of America, right? The way it used to be, right? Yeah. So how do you make something that has the power of something that would be used by a Bank of America or Wells Fargo, you know, et cetera, um, but make it accessible to teams of 50 to 2,000, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. not 50,000, right? Um, and that is a challenge. Uh, and, and then on top of that, not just usable on the UI and the UX side, but also on the power side, is it enforceable? Like you said, it's extremely important still mm-hmm. to know 100% that a developer is not seeing a credit card, right? Mm-hmm. That a marketing team is not seeing a social because they don't need to and they shouldn't. But if you can't say that 100% certain, then you can't say it at all. Yeah. And so the, the question of enforceability is a big one. So so what we ended up doing is actually an interception methodology that can actually, uh, it funnels traffic, so it links to any you know gateway or proxy, et cetera, okay. um, that's already been configured, et cetera, or we can, we can always configure a proxy for them, but the, or, or a gateway. But what we found is that a lot of companies that are worried about this uh, are using bundled tools, uh, you know, the, Semantics, the fire eyes, the you know the just free business proxies that they're setting up, or or you know gateways through things like AppGate. Uh, so back to the question of perimeters, a lot of companies are using software to find perimeters, right? They're already funneling traffic, but they don't have this data security component. It's that last last mile. So what we're doing is we're linking to all of those existing methodologies, so that the customer can actually literally just turn it off. They don't yeah, deploy yeah. us; they just connect us, right? And that was what I mean is like you gotta think of the full 
cycle of the, of the customer. And that really was where we finally kind of hit that, that stride and the customers, you know, needed this. It wasn't being provided in the applications. They needed something easy to use, easy to deploy. And I use deploy in quotes because really it's just connecting. Um, you just connect us up and then you get visibility and control over data that any of your teams anywhere in the world and any applications use in plain English. And that again was important to me as a non-developer. I want the ability to say, I'm working with this new developer, make sure he doesn't see credit cards. Done. Oh yeah. I mean, you bring up that, uh, the developer is, is, is kind of become your 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 archetype for, you know, the, the person that needs to have controlled access. I mean, it's a good one because it's actually, yeah. it's probably a tremendously overlooked one. Um, but but uh, I really see just just in kind of the path you you brought up also kind of the Biden administration's you know uh, in, you know increased kind of like guidelines soon to become you know more and more requirements. So I see this path of you know more and more requirements for very granular uh, uh, you know demonstration uh, beyond you know you know, policies and attestation, uh, which, you know, are great. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm wonderful that, that, that the, you know, the industry is maturing there, but yeah, it's, it's not going to be good enough for, for sensitive work, government work, you know, uh, privacy, you know, uh, HIPAA, PII, uh, stuff. Um, so I, I just, I, I just think, you know, that it's, you, there's just no way that, uh, the whole, all the SaaS companies and the database companies in the world are going to kind of get this kind of granular field level, Kind of controls and you know and and uh, uh, and proof and, and compliance group um, you know just done in an elegant uh, way and uh, and your layered approach uh, uh, definitely just nails it today which is thank you for that existing but I want your thoughts too on the industry I want your thoughts on like you know put your hat on now of like okay you know I uh, I saw the industry I watched the industry I had you know. The bands, you know, brought to me and, 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 you know, light bulbs went off like, okay, we have to solve this. There's this whole attack surface that's, you know, kind of unaddressed, whatever. Um, so, uh, but now, you know, now that you have that mindset, now that you're cynical, even let's say about like, you know, I am certainly about like, you know, are we really addressing all this stuff? Let's not just kind of rest on our laurels and continue the path around, you know, put that hat back on. You know, this is, you know, Robert at the early season, if I like, oh, my God, there's these attack surfaces, you know, just what do you else do you see? Where do you see the industry going? What stuff is maybe unaddressed or just needs a lot of attention, perhaps? Sure. Yes, yeah. yeah, I think, I mean, it's a great question, obviously. I mean, you know, it's it's the, the key question here. Um, and, I, and I think I see it uh, as a multifaceted question, obviously. Um, I, would, I, would, I would bring it back, almost zoom out a little bit okay. and say, you know, okay. I think 2010, even even say five years ago, the mantra in the business world about data was collect, 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 collect. I mean, just literally could not collect enough data, okay. literally. Um, and the reason for that, of course, was you collect and you figure out what you're going to do with it later, right? It can only help you. You'll be surprised by correlations you're not thinking of between clients and deals and, you know, uh, products even. And, uh, you know, that will suddenly magically in, in a year from now, you don't know when or how, but it's going to catapult your business forward when you okay. see that magic connection, right? Um, and it just wasn't ever thought of that that data would be, in fact, potentially your undoing, right? Or or the source oh, of, you know, oh. you just got hit with an $81 million privacy fine. Right now, I'm not saying that'll bankrupt them, but for a smaller company, 60% of, you know, small businesses go out of business within a year after a data loss event, right? So it yeah. can literally crush you um and that's extremely sad um so i think the real the real kind of where the market's going is in light of that um and in light of what you were just talking about where where it's actually starting to become a mass uh mass market level question and awareness uh, not just with president biden of course but but with consumers being something like two-thirds of them are less likely to work with a business that experienced a cybersecurity event last year right i mean that's they're voting with their wallets okay and okay yeah. Um, so I think, and that that's prompting things like political pressure, like the GDPR requirements, CCPA, right? People oh, are starting to respond. True. It's responsive, true, but it is true. it is. So I think there there are a few uh, things that I see the market going to. One is is that the the second um and and pushing that into mass market. The second is that people are really realizing that data is not ones and zeros. That would, that's a fundamental sea change. I, it's hard for me to overstate how important it is that normal people are understanding that data is things like their children's food allergies, right? A company storing that, that's what they're storing. It's not a line of code. It's the fact that their kid is allergic, deathly allergic to peanuts. They're travel itineraries, 
right? The, the code to their garage. The, I mean, all of that put together, someone knows that you're out of town, your garage door opener, and your kid is deathly allergic to peanut. That's really, really bad, right? Um, for an average everyday person, they appreciate that's really bad. So I think that's that's pushing it further. Um, that paired with the idea that it's, you know, there's a huge increase in, obviously, again, hot button word, I know, but things like, it's like ransomware, things like DDoS, things like phishing, especially in post-COVID world, um, you know, that's, that's getting everyone uh, even scared, even scared, because English, yeah. um, but even more scared, right, um, about what's being done with that very real data. Um, and, and really, it's culminating in a sea change of why. And so that pendulum is now actually finally getting momentum behind it to push back against the collect, 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 collect. Um, and that CISO, that CIO, that CTO, you know, the head of IT is, you know, they're, they're overworked, they're exhausted, they're getting fired left and right for, for all these uh, risks that they're, they're you know, not able to fully mitigate against. And I think they're, they're starting to say, like, why are we collecting this tab? Just stop, right? Yeah. Let's collect what we need, how we need it, then let's figure out how to secure it. And that's really important. That's why I think the market on that side of the equation is going. Now, I will say, on the, the cybersecurity side of the, the market, there's also a few things that that has implications for. First is with that pendulum swing comes the real question of how do you protect data in a way that maintains usability? Because you can, I mean, let's be real, any company can make their data super secure by making it completely unusable even to them, right? I mean, that's yeah. not a challenge. It's like, it's like we always joke, my father was in the airline uh, industry and he said, guys, flying is not a problem, it's landing, <laughs> right? Um, it's true. Right? I mean, it's, you can always make data secure. The real question is how and when do you make it unsecured and do you track that? Do you control that? That's really the, the push pull. And I think um, nailing that is where the industry is really going to have to do some work. Um, and some of the other focuses are, are how do you do that for applications and tools that you didn't build? An application you build and you have source code to control. I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's a lot right, easier. Right. <laughs> you don't, yeah. Um, Obviously, everyone knows right now, remote teams. How do you secure remote teams? I think that's going to be a key area of focus. Some people thought it would die down as COVID, you know, vaccinations went up and everything. I think aside from all the uh, politics and all that, factually speaking, a lot of workplaces have been announcing that they're fully remote forever now. Yeah. Right. Yeah, um, yeah we so did that, that too. That yeah. cool. You did that exactly. Mm -hmm. And so did we. So I think that's going to be a big thing. Now, the 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 real interesting element, though, I would say, and then I'll wrap it up. Like I said, I'll, I, I talk a lot, is the people and the processes because what people always ignore is 60 percent of of data you know losses and, and i use that loosely involve an insider at the company and that does not mean malicious insider it means mm -hmm. an insider someone who works yeah. there they can be negligent they can make a mistake they can do something they just weren't trained on they weren't negligent or a mistake they just didn't know they weren't supposed to right mm -hmm. um and that's a big problem so so a training component's crucial but you also need to pair training with technology and that's really where i think people are seeing that that kind of convergence and, and where people are appreciating how does the technology bolster our position rather than than reduce it how do you balance that with the usability how do you balance that with remote teams all of that coming to a head so you need the people you need the processes you need the training you need the technology um but what going back to your first question um of of kind of <clears throat> excuse me what what's um complicated about it is what about when you hire new people and firing and shifting roles, getting promoted. You want to try a new application, you know, that new marketing hire that you hired to do exactly this, which is they found a new marketing tool. They think it would really drive numbers up for the next quarter. You want them to be doing that. You know, you, you don't get called into the office and get in trouble or something like that. Um, but the problem is to try that app, they need to put in customer email addresses. Boom, just like that, there's an exposure. So the question is how do they maintain usability and protection? That's going to be the key focus. And I'm going to pull also from, um, you know, the... Uh, one of one of my, a very well respected practitioner in cybersecurity space is um, General uh, General Tuhill, and uh, formerly president of AppGate, uh, that company I mentioned before. He you know he said really that uh, the emphasis has to be on usability because we need to know our tools better than anyone else. Okay. Foundationally, yeah. we have to know the tools in our arsenal right better than the adversary, and that's I think just foundationally. Uh, that's true. Uh, of course, adoption of zero trust methodologies. I think that started obviously something like 20 years ago, um, but really has been accelerating. And that's a really great thing to see uh, because it is fundamentally just a great design principle in security. Um, and then collaboration and cooperation, right? Uh, tools, vendors, cybersecurity uh, practitioners can't be siloed. 
They have to share knowledge. They have to share threats. But going back to the usability, because I think that's where I kind of come in um, on my own mindset is not just that we need to know the tools better than the adversaries, but coming back to cybersecurity being a main stream concern now. Yeah, yeah. That's not just talk as in like, oh, cool, people are worried about it. But what that also means is that you have more companies that are now buyers of cybersecurity. And as you, you know, I, I call it, there are a lot more informal practitioners that yeah. head of IT, you know, now needs to answer customer questions about cybersecurity. He didn't have to three years ago. Um, and what that means is he's going to, or she, of course, um, though cybersecurity, unfortunately, is still one of those male dominated areas. But, you know, the, the IT practitioner is, of course, going to have to train themselves up and find tools that they can use. So the usability is not just in terms of us understanding the tool better than adversaries. It's also back to the question of who's using it. And now more people are using it with less sophisticated knowledge. They need to protect same sensitivity of data for more companies that also don't know a whole lot about cybersecurity. And quite frankly, I actually love this because I think it is pushing two things. One is uh, pushing vendors to simplify their offering. And that's extremely important, right? They are building tools that are usable without six months of 20 developers, you know, spending full time just configuring it. Um, and that wasn't efficient even for the big companies. That's still yeah, not good, yeah. like I said, right? So there's a huge trend towards usability and simplification. Um, and I think in line with, with you know, Stel, what you were talking about is I think the people, the processes, but also the transparency. And that transparency has to extend to data and all the way out to transparency to the vendor. How are they doing what they're doing? Why are they doing what they're doing? What does it protect you against? And also, how do you use it? How do you maintain it? How do you update it? Um, and how is it better than not doing this? So I think that the market's really trending towards simplicity, 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 collaboration, transparency, um, and a more mainstream understanding of why data is important, why data privacy is important, um, and really what we can do about it, not just on the endpoint level and not just on the database level, but the full uh, spectrum, end to end, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, of, of real kind of cybersecurity threat protection. And th no, those are excellent lessons. And I, I, I agree, they're, they're, they're getting awareness, you know, and they're, they're being learned. Uh, I wish it were faster, I mean, you know, we can, we can talk about that. Uh, but throw in your whole point about simplicity and that really kind of amplifies it. It says like, wait a minute, maybe this is why we haven't moved faster is because there hasn't been that kind of mindset. So thank you. Well, uh, Robert, this is great. And, uh, you know, thanks for being a leader uh, in this, you know, extremely important space. I mean, you know, you know, our, our, our slogan, uh, because security gives us freedom specifically refers to this, you know, we don't want you to say no to that new marketing platform. We want you to do it. We want you to do a lot of confidence and, you know, let's give you tools and rules and people and process to enable that. Uh, that's, that's, you know, kind of where we're coming from. Um, uh, anyway, yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, and I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. And you're wonderful to have you on. Um, I know there's two or three other topics we've talked about in the past that I think we should, uh, you know, get back together and get into those. Uh, thanks okay. for, for nullify addressing a really a kind of a, a difficult challenge on, and, you know, adding a layer to add controls at the field level for data uh, to applications that even thought about that. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, we certainly are, uh, you know, uh, enhanced by that because we get telemetry that, you know, we can kind of alert on and uh, give uh, clients a much more confident security posture picture as a result. So this is why Entra loves Nullify. So uh, yeah, no, there I, you go. I appreciate it. Everything goes both ways. I love onshore and, and your, you know, kind of uh, strategy focused uh, compliance and, and the idea that technology is a piece, but you do need, you know, a fuller strategy to, to really be uh, in, as you said, get freedom. The ironic part is it's not meant to tie your hands. It's you need this to be free in your business operations and your personal operations, everything, right? Um, it's, it is it is very deep problem. So thank you guys for doing the work that you do with your clients, really. I've okay. always re respected and appreciated it. All right. Well, congrats all around. Woo. And thanks, yeah, uh, <laughs> Josh uh, Eklo, our producer. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, guys. Uh, and we'll see you all uh, next time. Okay.